The, I'd like to start with a little uh, philosophy. I think we're in a very unusual time. Uh, we're used to uh, IT revolutions, you know, moving from desktop to laptop, laptop to smartphone. We've now got a perfect storm of technologies and things are happening that we're getting out of control. And um, for example, um, You've got massive, uh, it's going to cause massive disruption to uh, society and employment. You've got the uberization uh, of finance. Uh, you've got, as was mentioned this morning, uh, the, um, you know, professional jobs being replaced by robo ad advisors. And I would just like to, to go back to the magnitude, I think, of what's going on around us. Um, in the UK in 1830, 80% of the population lived and worked in the countryside. 30, 35 years later, 50% uh, of them had moved to towns and cities. The point of saying this is that we do not know what is going to happen in the next five or six years and expect to see many large companies that have been around for a long time simply disappearing. This is the sort of magnitude that I expect. And one of the areas that's going to have a big impact is compliance and regulation. It is getting more burdensome. And what the people who are putting these regulations out don't seem to recognize is that they will destroy the finance industry, the pharmaceutical industry, etc., or drive them to Asia. So we need to uh, reform these uh, things. Now, a bit about my history. Um, you know, we're engineers, we build things. Uh, 25 years ago, uh, we um, built the first insider dealing detection system for the London Stock Exchange. Uh, and the first time they ran it, it identified seven people engaged in insider dealing. And five of them were actually prosecuted. And we had half the front page of the Financial Times. So it got us trying to do big things. I told you it was good to have you around. <laughs> it now works, does it? Okay, let's have a try. Okay. Don't worry, I can I can survive. The uh, on the back of this, uh, we developed a lot of the early uh, financial fraud detection technology, like card fraud, insurance fraud, uh, etc., and spun out uh, quite a nice uh, company. Um, for the past 14 years, uh, we've pioneered the use of algorithmic trading systems, and I'll talk a little bit about that because it's a sort of natural uh, move from what we were doing in algorithmic trading into algorithmic regulation. And again, um, with the fraud detection, the stock exchange turned up, so we've got this dreadful problem that no one can tackle. And about 14 years ago, Deutsche Bank turned up and said, there's a lot of discussion about algorithmic trading. Um, we thought we might try and build a proof of concept. Uh, interestingly, uh, we, we built a fixed income system and they just stuck it straight into production and it made them, unfortunately not me, a huge amount of money. Uh, and then we went on to do uh, FX with Citigroup and um, uh, US equities with Citadel and, and some, of, some of the others. And what I'm trying to do now is to try and fully automate regulation in the same sort of way. And we've had a <clears throat> really good response from the Financial Conduct Authority in London. I'll go through some of the things uh, that we're doing. Interestingly, uh, this has almost become an economic war amongst the regulators. So last week, they rang me up and said, we're not happy with the pace, ramp it up. <laughs> so I'll uh, talk about some of the other things they want to ramp up. The other interesting thing that, that, we're, that we're working on that you might like to think about is the legal status of algorithms. Now, as you'll know, uh, companies are artificial persons and l algorithms have basically reached that stage. You have algorithms that are out there serving people that are um, biased, breaking the law and all sorts of things. So there's a lot of discussion in the UK of whether we need to, how we need to give algorithms legal status and possibly even set up a national regulator for, uh, for, for algorithms. Uh, how do I do this? Well, uh, unfortunately, to be I'm in a computer science department. I've got 80 PhDs. Uh, we have three to 400 master's students uh, and about the same number of undergraduates. 
how do I manage these? I put them out onto poor, unsuspecting companies to uh, build things, so they're not around bothering me. Uh, 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 but, they're, uh, but seriously, they're a great source of experimentation, and I would encourage you here to, uh, to, to do this. Um, so, algorithmic uh, trading. Uh, as I said, we got into this almost by accident, you know, with uh, Deutsche Bank t turn, turning up. And um, the, the interesting thing about it is that um, is the amount of data you process, the short time, so it, it is the cutting edge of, of, of analytics. So at the top, okay, I'll hold my finger up. Uh, uh, you, you stream in all sorts of data. It used to be just um, trading data, economic data. They now even do things like flying in what they call alternative data, how many cars are in a supermarket car park. You know, crop yields are pretty uh, uh, straightforward. Next, you have the alpha model, uh, and that's the model that tries to work out uh, what the best uh, a set of things are to invest in. The risk model then does a risk analysis on all possible risks involved with it so that it can index them. And lastly, for every possible trading transaction, you have a transaction cost model, which is a big uh, spreadsheet. Then from that, you decide what you're holding that you want to get rid of, what you then want to hold, uh, sorry, to buy, and then finally, uh, the execution model uh, the, uh, goes out and tries to quietly get rid of the things you don't want, uh, and then tries to quietly buy the things at the lowest possible price. And then it goes around and it sucks in more data, and it tries to do that in a few milliseconds. Uh, so it's a pretty useful um, education. And then along came the flash crash, uh, which was also quite interesting. It wiped 600 billion off the American markets uh, in 20 minutes. And there was a lot of um, concern that, the, um, that algorithmic trading was actually the cause of this. Uh, what it really, what we came to after you know, building models, studying it, etc. Firstly, nobody really knows what happened. There's no solid opinion. But what the algorithmic trading model seems to have done is take, taken you know, a lack of liquidity and then magnified that and dumb, you know, dumb down, clear all its books. Equally, when the um, investors who really knew what they were doing uh, kicked in and started saying, hey, this price is crazy, I'm going to buy everything I can, that created liquidity. And then the algorithmic trading models just pulled everything back up. But essentially, this is what sort of got us into an interest in uh, regulation, trying to build these um, artificial exchanges and that to try and work out how flash crashes worked. Financial regulation. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, I expect you've heard the story of the king with no clothes and the little boy saying, the king's got no clothes on. Um, Compliance and regulation is supposed to cost the banking industry 280 billion a year. Uh, it's rising, and to consume 10% of the workforce, and it's rising, I think it's clear to say it can't go on. It'll just, and if you go into, uh, into many banks, uh, at least in the UK, their biggest concern is not making money, it's, um, it's compliance and you know, not breaking any, any rules. You've also got this situation with um, organizations like Deutsche Bank are regulated you know, in, in 54 different jurisdictions. Uh, the uh, regulators, are ha are there, people are giving them more and more regulations to implement, uh, and therefore they're, they're, they're overwhelmed with work. Uh, and the handbooks of a typical regulator are, um, well, there's a lot of it, anyway. Uh, the, the, uh, and and you, you find contradictions. Uh, they're, they're, in many cases, they're impenetrable. Uh, and then on top of this, uh, you've got things like MIFID II, GDPR, etc. If you look at these uh, regulations, they're internally inconsistent. You can have different views within them. And 
Interestingly, when you've got things like uh, GDPR and also the, pub the EU public sector push for open data, they're in direct conflict. So, uh, and this is causing enormous headaches for the financial firms. So things are getting, uh, getting, uh, getting worse. At the same time, you've got Donald Trump saying he's going to either repeal Dodd-Frank or ramp down regulation. You've got Singapore that's pouring huge amounts of some uh, money into looking at new technology to improve regulation, uh, and the same in Hong Kong and, and, and China. So it's become uh, somewhat of a competition. So what we have here now is we have increased regulation compliance, costing the companies a huge amount of money. Where we are now, uh, with uh, at least in London and Singapore, trying to automate the compliance functions to uh, speed it up, reduce cost, you know, uh, make it easier, particularly for fintech companies, and. What we're talking about now, uh, talking to the big banks, because it's ridiculous that they're, they're collectively taking on this 280 billion burden, is that they should totally rethink regulation. You know, what would you do if you started again with a clean sheet? Because not only have we got the burden of compliance and regulation, but it isn't really working very well. You know, it, it's so confusing, people are trying to find their ways uh, uh, around it. Does anybody know what this film is? Would it? Pardon? Thank you. I can never remember us, but there's always somebody in the audience can. But I did, I did, I did put up this. Uh, for those of you who didn't uh, see the film, uh, this is where they're using predictive analytics. Uh, and it, it might seem a bit far-fetched in the film, but already predictive analytics are being used to identify uh, individuals and firms uh, th that are likely to uh, you know, be, uh, to to break the law. So it's quite an interesting uh, technology. <clears throat> so um, this has been covered before. So I'll just run through the two uh, the two AI technologies that that are important because I'll mention them. The first is rule-based systems. Now these have been around for a long time, and this is what drives most call centres. So you code up the knowledge of an expert in terms of if then ruse, uh, rules, uh, uh, and then th th you just work through, you know, some operator works through them. Um, more interestingly, particularly when we're getting on to the legal status of algorithms, is machine learning. Some you train, some discover patterns, uh, okay? And the, the next technology uh, is um, distributed ledger technology, uh, which is part of uh, blockchain, which is described very well th this morning. Thank you for, for that. Where you've got basically a distributed database. What wasn't mentioned this morning, I believe, is the smart contract technology, where the aim is to actually have legal or transactions actually coded up as computer programs. And this, these two technologies work together, uh, and, and the, this is the code that actually drives uh, things like settlement where, where there's no human involvement. So what are we trying to do? We've got here the whole sort of gamut of, um, uh, of, our, of regulation, and what we're trying to do, as with um, algorithmic trading, we're trying to automate all the sort of monitoring functions and, and also registration. We're obviously not trying to automate enforcement. Uh, at the top, you've got automated advice, giving advice to people who want to register uh, with an authority or understand uh, the interpretation of the rule book. Um, the regulators are now uh, having to deal with large numbers of very small firms, uh, particularly what we call doorstep loan companies, you know, that they're, or payday loan companies that are giving money to, um, you know, very poor people uh, and often behave abusing the, the market. Uh, next is automating reporting uh, so that you can actually re deliver your reports in some XML-based uh, technology. And then a more sort of interesting, I guess, for the academics is, can we actually code up regulatory policy in some algorithmic way using smart contract technology? And um, this is a sort of mega diagram. Uh, what we're concentrating on mainly at the moment, 
with the uh, FCA is trying to automate uh, uh, advice. Um, we're also working um, on doing online monitoring. And one of the most easy ones with, with SISEC in Cyprus is looking for binary options companies. Uh, this the, the, we said, oh, very difficult. And then an undergraduate found out that you can just scan through their web pages automatically, and most of them aren't even registered with any uh, uh, um, any authority. And the, the second giveaway is that where they've used endorsements, they use pictures off the web people that have nothing to do with them. And you can actually find this very easy with Google Chrome. Well, I haven't told the authority that an undergraduate solved it in about five minutes, but anyway, we'll move on. Um, the other thing that's very interesting and in picking up, particularly now with the regulators, is actually the bit over at the end, which is coding up the rules so that you can actually analyze them and look for consistency and then go to actually automated um, uh, e execution. <clears throat> So um, we're doing. We have three projects that that are underway with, with the regulator. Uh, the the first one is to is like a uh, a regulatory lawyer, and what it does is we've coded up. Uh, we're coding up the rules of the registration rules that you'd normally ask a client uh, uh, as uh, as an expert system, a rule-based system, and and what this is to do is it goes through, interacts with the client, tries to fill in the registration form, and then the registration form is given to a regulatory lawyer uh, to actually. So you try and cut out the the, the sort of dead time uh, where the lawyer is trying to find out whether the um, person who's trying to register understands what a security is, which they often don't, right? <laughs> uh, the, the next one is to provide, um, is to take basically the same technology and see if we can actually completely automate re registration for things like credit uh, by plugging it directly uh, into the um, <coughs> In, in, into the FCA handbook. Uh, but, the, but the one that's caused the most um, interest is the last one. And um, the students show up at my door, master's student, saying, I want to ch build a chat box. OK, um, what do you plan to do with it? Well, we thought we might uh, get the chat bot to fill in HR forms. Mm, well, it sounds a bit boring to me. Uh, I've got a copy of the FCA handbook in XML. Why don't you connect the chat bot to the FCA handbook? Might not work, but you know, it sounds well. That's wonderful. We'll do that. Actually, we've got a project with Amazon, so therefore we've got access to the Alexa technology. So why don't you connect Amazon Alexa uh, to the FCA handbook? And they they thought they were ecstatic, uh, and and the FCA were ecstatic as well. I thought. Actually, it's probably not going to work, and I'm going to look a real idiot. Uh, so I went around trying to close everybody's expectations down. But it's actually working quite well. Uh, and when they demoed this um, Alexa connection to the uh, to the handbook, it was able to answer a number of the questions better than some of the FCA staff. <laughs> Good for us. <laughs> Now, the, the next one is really standard sort of um, re, uh, retail type technology uh, where you're just scraping uh, online media, uh, looking for usually customers complaining uh, that, that they've been, uh, you know, somebody's abusing the marketplace. Uh, what the regulator would like to do, but I don't know we know how to do it, is to actually identify emerging problems like the um, what, what's called PPI in uh, excuse me in, in in the UK, but you know that's for the future. Now some of this is actually quite easy. Um, Cyprus um, is having a lot of pressure put on them because there's a lot of um, uh, binary options companies that are, you know, complete and utter swindlers, I think is probably the best way to, to, to describe it, uh, and causing lots of problems in the, in, um, 
across across the EU, uh, and they didn't know how to find these companies, and it's actually very easy because it's all on their website. Uh, so you can look to see whether anybody's reg uh, regulated them. Often they're, they're not regulated. Uh, you can look and see, as we said about using stock photos for customer endorsements, uh, but you can even look at the sentiment of what they're saying on the website to see if they're actually exaggerating. So that's relatively straightforward. The, the one that we've got in the UK, I'll take them now, shall I? Uh, the, um, don't give them out until I finish. Okay. The, um, the one that's more difficult, uh, surprisingly, is the, in the UK, where we're looking to see poor people complaining because it's not obvious, you know, these people are not going to go on to Twitter or Facebook because they're unsophisticated. And it's an extremely difficult task because we've got the technology, but we haven't got the data. And it's and we, we've got a thing called the Citizens Advice Bureau, which probably is about the best we can, uh, can do. Um, automated reporting, there's quite a growing number of reg tech companies uh, in this area uh, that, are, that, are, that are supplying uh, technology, particularly based on XML, uh, where you can actually connect your accounting system or whatever uh, to the, um, uh, you know, in our case, the FCA, to the regulator. Uh, and um, you can put the information into a blockchain uh, and you can uh, then just, you know, send it off to the uh, to, to, to the regulator. So absolutely doing nothing in, in that area because it, it's sort of the, the reg tech companies are, you know, really setting the pace there. Um, this is a really interesting area for, uh, for academics. Uh, and all of a sudden for the regulators, what we would like to do is to code up the regulations uh, and that in using smart contract technology, uh, um, particularly uh, so that not just that we can get the regulations to automatically scan through the compliance reports, but also to do things like uh, modeling so we can see whether there are contra contradictory regulations. Or more interestingly, we have obviously haven't done hardly anything, is to use it to actually predict the impact of regulation. So using things like agent-based technologies, it should be possible uh, to, to do this, but it may be a 10-year uh, uh, project. The, um, all of a sudden, the regulators are actually really interested in this technology, uh, primarily for the first line, so that they can actually try and automate some of the processing they're doing on the compliance reports. So if we've got Particularly the last tech two technologies. If we if you've got the compliance reports coming automatically in um, XML, uh, and we've got the smart contract technology, uh, then you can automate monitoring and 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 do it more effectively. And but I'll try and finish exactly on time. Okay, two minutes. The discussion that we're having with the big banks, and the big banks are now starting to take this uh, extremely seriously, is even if we automate it, it's still going to be a big burden for everybody. It's still going to cost an enormous amount. And what we need to do is to try and think it through completely. What would we do? And, we and we've got the opportunity to do this with fintech, where there are lots of areas like IOCs, where there is no regulation. Uh, and that is, uh, can we think of it, what would we do if we were starting again? And the idea is to put the burden of compliance on the fintech company by providing them with certified software, not necessarily from the regulator, almost probably from fintech companies. The fintech um, company then uh, d does their own compliance, runs their own compliance uh, software, and keeps the data and returns back to the FCA a blockchain token. 
And then if the FCA doesn't believe to say that they've done this, and if the FCA doesn't believe them or at some stage wants to access the data, they can use the blockchain token to actually um, do this. And this is an area now the banks are starting, or at least in the UK, are starting to take very seriously. And uh, Santander are leading a group at trying to actually, you know, persuade the regulators and the and the government that, that this is a good thing to do and presumably they'll pay because it's such a burden to them. So that's a quick run through. Uh, so we're trying to automate various things, uh, starting with um, the uh, <coughs> registration, because it can take 18 months to register a, a new bank in the UK, uh, and also the, the um, problem of actually understanding the FCA uh, handbook. But the, the, the goal, you could say the two goals are firstly to use smart contract technology to um, uh, tie down the regulations so that you can actually get consistency and also code that's executable. But the big win is if we can do something uh, like this, uh, where we can actually totally rethink uh, regulation. Technology first. Um, mm. Switch on. Uh, it's not easy to talk about the regulation after Philip, uh, but I will try. Um, what I will try to do is basically to, to provide a simple frame of, of uh, reference for answering a very simple question. Uh, should regulators care about innovation? And then I will try to focus a little bit more on, on what are the limits on artificial intelligence, blockchain, and automation, what they can do and what they can't do. Uh, on the uh, well, first I also must say that I, I disagree with Philip on on and partly on the issue of of uh, compliance cost and, and regulatory burden. I think in reality. It might actually be true that rules, there are too many rules, and I, I agree there on record, but also it might be the case that before financial crisis, the rules were simply not sufficient. There were simply not enough of the right rules. There were not enough of the right rules of liquidity. The capital in banks was too low. Corporate governance didn't work. The incentive system in banks was totally perverted. I could go on and go on. So just on the record, I think it might be that your thesis is right, there are too many rules, but also it might be the case that there were not too many right rules. I'm not sure that all of the right rules are in place today, but uh, that's something that I think we should all strive for. Uh, I also have no comment on compliance cost of 280 uh, billion per year. I think equally well, there could be a question whether people are doing the right thing with that money. And also it might be the case whether the business is, is, is still profitable. As you know, for most European banks, return on equity, as you're very well informed of, is, is below the cost of equity. So, so there might be some bigger problems than just compliance. Um, but coming back to my kind of main two points, uh, the, the role of of uh, the, the frame for thinking about the role of regulators, whether we should care about innovation. I think the question is is relevant, but the answer is rather obvious. Yes, the supervisors should care about the innovation, and, and they should care about the innovation primarily to do their job of protecting consumers and ensuring financial stability. Um, it is true that the, uh, many of the innovative products are, are making life for consumers easier. They are making uh, important improvements in business models, making accessibility to finance, especially in developing countries, easier. But at the same time, they introduce new risks. And, and for that reason, I argue that simply to do our job, we need to follow the developments very closely. And we need to understand those risks that the new technology is exposing consumers to, and also uh, the new risks to financial stability. Uh, why do we need to do that? Well, just for the, because of the very simple reason that interests of financial firms are not always 100% aligned with the interests of society. Often they uh, sharply diverge. So for us, when we talk about financial innovation, we need to answer a very simple question, namely whether the new products or services uh, introduce new risks, exacerbate existing risks, and uh, whether this is acceptable, or do we need to do something about that? If the answer is that yes, the risks are increased, then of course we need to have another test, namely whether doing something uh, and introducing new regulation uh, is, is clearly uh, outweighing the costs of the new regulation, because regulation is not cost neutral. So you have to do those, you have to do those kind of calculations uh, in, in, an honest, uh, in an honest manner. 
And of course, if that is the case, if the costs of regulation are, are clearly uh, not exceeding the, the benefits from the regulation, uh, and if there is a clear case that financial stability or consumer uh, protection is in danger, uh, then of course, you have to act as a regulator. Um, so that's why it's important to kind of underline that regulators need to care about uh, financial innovation. Now, of course, we have seen that regulators care about innovation uh, in more than one way. Uh, recent debate about the regulatory role in development of fintech actually is, is, is dealing with a rather marginal uh, question about how regulators on the top of their usual role can also support fintech by doing something in excess of what they used to do before by proactively supporting new firms, uh, by uh, establishing sandboxes or, or, or incubators, uh, by helping firms through the licensing process, by issuing temporary or limited licenses to help experiment uh, with products and services that might be beneficial for financial stability. To me, those are all very relevant issues, um, but they should not uh, overwhelm the key role that we as regulators should play in innovation. Now, when it comes to those specific roles, we can see that regulatory agencies have taken a rather different approaches in the spectrum between, let's say, the German approach, which is very restrictive, towards the Singaporean approach and the approach taken by the UK FCA, which is, and the Hong Kong, of course, which is very much developmental. I think for us, at the Swedish FSA, this is an open question, which um, we will answer by the end of November. We have to submit a report to the government, uh, basically stating where on this spectrum uh, we do want to uh, find ourselves, um, and, um, and I think we will do that in respecting the Swedish tradition of administrative law and also in, in, in keeping in mind uh, what are our traditional strengths in Scandinavia in terms of uh, you know, supporting rule of law, being neutral in terms of our uh, exercise of public authority, and uh, in, in, um, in making sure that, that we have uh, you know, clear, transparent decision making and I'm not putting ourselves in situations of conflicts of interest, which we can't manage, because you know, morally, as authority, which is in charge of uh, ensuring that banks do not run into conflicts of interest, uh, we need to make sure that we manage ours as well, and, and not least in the fintech space. That being said, let me just uh, turn very briefly to the other question on, on the, the limits of, of, uh, of artificial intelligence in compliance. And I think my uh, thesis is, is very simple. I think we, there are a lot of areas where the use of, of quantitative data and better processing of quantitative data and, and algorithms can actually be beneficial. And just to name a few, I guess, you know, preventing market manipulation is something where, you know, if banks can make sure that it doesn't occur before it actually takes place, that's a major gain for society. The same applies to money laundering. If banks can stop suspicious transactions before they take place, of course, they, they, they serve society well. But at the same time, I think we don't need to be naive. I think there are places where, where the amount of data does not help to, to, to take better decisions. If you, if you uh, look at the uh, situation before financial crisis, I think it was rather the lack of capacity to analyze the data that authorities had that resulted in an underestimation of risks. The lack of understanding of, for instance, how liquidity risk interacts with, uh, with the risk of capital that, that led to, the, uh, to some of the problems that we have seen with the, with the subprime. Um, so I think we need to uh, we need to be aware that the the amount of data is not always the best answer. It's not always more data, or it's not always more quantitative analysis. But it's it's still the the human capacity to make sense of all the data that there is out there, and 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 to have you know. Uh, um, sensible analytical reasoning based on, on conventional economic theories, which sometimes is what I find uh, lacking. So that particular space I don't think can be filled by, by anybody else. Um, and um, finally, I would like basically to, um, to also kind of have a word of wording about artificial intelligence. It seems that we are all very hyped, especially about uh, those models which are not based on preset criteria, but without about those models which are based on, on kind of uh, you know, learning by themselves and unsupervised learning uh, as, as a concept. And 
And I just want to say that as a regulator, I see a lot of similarities between those artificial intelligence models and internal models. And, and we, have, we have done a lot of thinking about internal models, all the benefits that they have, but also all the risks that they have. You know, risks for being manipulated, risks for being built in a way that you know, minimizes the need for capital, risks for, for, for misusing the consumer trust, risks for maximizing profit at the expense of information asymmetries between the institution and the customers. Uh, so just, just a, a note of warning that, that you know, in terms of internal models, there are two things which are important. It is that the decision makers actually understand uh, how those models work in terms of outputs. They don't need to understand you know, the, the formulas, but they need to understand the outputs that those models generate. And they also need to understand that they are still responsible. So it's not the programmer somewhere in the you know, uh, university or a PhD student you know, uh, of Philip who is going to be responsible for the, for, the, for the results those internal models generate. It's going to be the boards of the banks, insurance companies, and the asset managers who are going to be responsible for the outputs of those models. This is something that is important to keep in mind. So to conclude, I think the, the, the support of innovation is at the DNA of regulators. Uh, at the same time, we also realize that technology can bring a lot of benefits they, um, to consumers, but, but we, uh, we, would not, um, we would not hold hopes that, that the, the requirements for, uh, for human judgment, uh, human assessment and analysis uh, can ever be replaced by, by uh, quantitative uh, logic. Thank you. On my way here, uh, I had the experience, uh, which I think was a bit of a pertinent one when it comes to the subject we're going to talk about today. All my notes that I had uh, for this speech, I had on a pad. And of course, that pad went um, well, broke uh, about two hours before this, this conference. I think that's a bit of a telling, telling thing. We should be careful about technology. Um, and, and one thing, when I, when I was asked by pad to participate in this uh, uh, panel, uh, my first thought was, I'm excited. I'm a tech fanboy. Uh, whenever something with, with technology comes up, I think it's really interesting and I want to sort of hear more and more about it. I'm currently um, you know, following uh, a number of, of um, forums online and, and uh, looking to buy some gadgets and, and sort of those social things. I'm, I'm a tech fanboy. But uh, I also wanted to to uh, see, okay, what are my feelings about this? As a lawyer, I usually go out and represent the client, and the client wants to achieve something. And, and in this forum, I can express something which is my, these are my own thoughts. These are not the thoughts of my firm. These are my personal thoughts. Um, and I thought I would would uh, try to rein back my tech fanboydom a bit and uh, instead take the the somewhat unusual, a lawyer with the empathy approach. Uh, think, of, think of humanity. Um, because my, my problem here is that I agree with both uh, Philip and Nuldis, and I think your comments have been re really interesting and well received. I, there are tremendous opportunities with the fintech uh, development right now. And we can certainly simplify um, a lot of things using reg tech. I mean, the legislative and, and regulatory tsunami, if I may use that word, which has sort of engulfed the financial industry in the recent years, is almost in uh, um, impossible to manage. Uh, and those that have uh, or claim that they are compliant with it, they, I think it's correct that they probably spend a lot of money on, on doing so. Then whether or not that money is, is well spent or spent on the right things might be another. Uh, but I, I think that yes, this probably, it prevents uh, innovation in the sense that small players will have a very big hurdle to, to get over before they can enter this market. But once they do, um, of course, they might be in, in the money, so to speak. Uh, so I think RegTech can, can help us um, to, to level the playing field and allow for innovation, uh, more innovation. And also, someone said, oh, this is, all this regulation is going to be very difficult for the financial industry to, to cope with. I think that it's almost, or perhaps in some instances, even more difficult for the regulators to handle because they are the ones who are supposed to supervise all of this. And at the same time, the market is screaming for... Um, for manpower. And so where do you go to recruit? Well, it's a pretty good place to recruit if you go to the regulator. So the regulators are having a bad, uh, hard time keeping, keeping people. Um, 
But when I thought about uh, this subject, I've, I've actually taken care today to insert as many ancient uh, and old-fashioned uh, references that I can. Because you, Philip, you spoke about algorithms are almost people. Uh, I would contend that algorithms, if they are people, they are not close to humans. They are more like golem. Uh, the golem, if you don't know the, the golem myth, uh, it's, a, it's an old European myth. Uh, the golem uh, was a clay person uh, created by a rabbi who gave clay life and then he could order the golem to do certain tasks. And in some of the mythical uh, stories about golem, uh, the golem retaliates against the master by stupidly following orders forever just doing whatever the individual, the master, told them to do. And they dug a trench three kilometers long. Or they made clay pots until, until there was no more clay. And I think that's one of the things we need to think about when we talk about the fintech uh, development right now, and to talk about the use of algorithms, is that they are, yes, they are very good at following orders. They are very good at executing what we've told them to execute. But sometimes someone needs to step back and think, is that a good thing? I had uh, several colleagues during uh, the financial crash after Lehman Brothers who were involved with, with um, contracts, bank contracts. And uh, they all sort of... Uh, they didn't want to say it officially, but everyone knew that in many of those contracts there were standard provisions saying if this or that happens, for example, if a certain collateral uh, drops below a certain value, then the collateral needs to be realized and given to the bank. But everyone knew that if someone would actually follow through on that, that would mean that everyone's collateral would drop below that value. And everyone's collateral would have to go to the banks, who would then sit with collateral, which was not worth all that much. It happened with some real estate, where everyone just went around and told everyone, don't reevaluate your real estate right now, because that will trigger all the contracts. So let's not do anything right now and hope that the prices go up. Um, but if you have automatically executed uh, algorithms that automatically execute on what has been agreed in a contract, for example. You can get cascades, you can get uh, sudden effects at breakneck speeds, which no one is actually uh, prepared for, nor did anyone want it. Sometimes, I believe, you need to have, and that's the, sort of the difficulty here, I think that flash crashes and things like that can be prevented by algorithms. But I also think there's a need for a human to be involved in these processes. Sometimes a human needs to be there and say, OK, is this a really good idea? Sometimes the speed at which fintech operates now makes it difficult so that we don't actually have that human interaction. And I think that's something which is sorely needed. Um, I also think that you have to talk about some of the risks uh, with, um, with fintech and algorithms. Um, Philip, you used the example of the Minority Report movie. If you know the plot of the movie, uh, you know that the name of that movie comes from the fact that uh, they are using predictive analytics to predict whether or some, not someone would make, uh, commit a crime. And if uh, the algorithms which are housed in people's three individuals' brains, uh, if they conclude that, yes, this individual will commit a crime, then they preemptively arrest that person and uh, then they, they have them convicted for that crime. But the movie is actually about that one of the three uh, individuals, the three algorithms, disagrees. There is a minority saying, no, this isn't correct. Um, and I think that shows a, a bit of, of the vulnerability about trusting algorithms uh, and saying that, okay, we should believe in them and what they're doing is probably correct because it might not be. There might be an error. They are created by us and we are fallible. Um, and so that is, is a reason to sort of step back and think that maybe we should not rely on algorithms all that much, or at least not all the time. Um, and then also when it comes to complexity, yes, current the current regulatory landscape is very complex. It's extremely complex. It's, uh, we're all supposed to know the law, and we're all supposed to follow it. But it's probably impossible uh, for anyone to, to know uh, at least uh, the laws of an entire nation, and perhaps even the laws of, of uh, just concerning one regulatory area, such as, as finance or, or reg tech, uh, sorry, fin uh, finance regulatory 
uh, issues. Um, and I would say that uh, perhaps that is a good thing. Perhaps the speed at which this operates right now needs to be slowed down by human interaction a bit. Uh, perhaps we need to take a step back and not let the machines do all this uh, thinking for us. There needs to be a human involved. Um, if you take the flash crash, which uh, Philip also had a picture of, which happened in, in 2010, uh, I think it was one very telling thing you said was, nobody actually knows what happened. Uh, there is a comedy show in Britain called Little Britain, which has a skit where someone goes to a bank or goes into a reception area and asks a horrible lady behind the counter for help. And she just turns to the individual and says, computer says no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and nobody knows why. This, the computer says no, or the flash crash happened. And not a single human can actually tell what went on, what happened there, what actually happened to all that money, and why did it go this way. And, and so while I am a fanboy of, of technology, I think it's really exciting. I also think we need to slow down a bit uh, and I know that um, another another ancient uh, piece is... Does anyone know of Cassandra, the woman in Greek mythology, who has been given the power of foresight? She can foretell the future, but also the curse of no one believing her. Uh, and so Cassandra foretells the future, and everyone says, that's never going to happen, then it happens. And I know what I'm doing now is, is uh, sort of uh, a losing battle, uh, because if there is money at the end of the rainbow, people will go for it. But my, my foretelling here is that, so we don't have more flash crashes. We need to slow down a bit, maybe have a couple of humans interacting with all these systems and slowing things down. And I think what's needed is sometimes a reflection from both the fintech industry and the regulator that they should think about, about more about not if they can, but if they should. Should we allow certain types of high-speed trading? Should we allow certain types of, of uh, derivatives and so on and so forth? And from the regulator side, should we regulate this as hard as we actually do? And, and the last point I'd like to make and mention is, of course, privacy. Um, from my point of view, uh, this creates an immense amount of, of privacy concerns. A lot of the fintech um, innovations, for example, blockchain, relies on transparency. And transparency is often good. But there are things that we need and would like to keep private that we, that we might not want to share with everyone else. Uh, to take a, an illustrative example, um, how many people here own a, some sort of membership card or bonus card at a store? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. Uh, how many people own a mobile phone? I remember, I should ask who does not own a mobile phone. Um, if, if you followed privacy discussions during the last couple of years, uh, you might have heard of the Target case. Uh, there was uh, an article in the New York Times a while back, uh, a couple, several years ago, with uh, a story about the American chain store Target uh, that received a very angry phone call from a father of a 16-year-old girl. And, and uh, the father was very angry because Target had started sending the girl um, advertisements for pregnancy-related uh, items, nappies and things like that. And the father said, what are you doing send this, this, sending this stuff to my 16-year-old? That doesn't happen underneath my roof. And it turns out that, yes, of course, the girl was pregnant uh, because Target's computers could immediately discern that if a woman who was uh, at a, an age where she could have children, if she bought certain things, she's pregnant. There's no question about it. And so the algorithms calculated that, yes, this girl is pregnant, and without any human interaction, started sending her pregnancy-related advertisements, because there is no time uh, that is as good to break someone's pattern or get a new customer as when they are involved in a life-changing event. And that's just an example of how algorithms can suddenly you know, tell things about us we might not want them to know, uh, and they can interact with us without another human even being present or even taking part in that transaction or, or making a, a change to that, where it could have really privacy-invasive uh, 
problems for for the individual or feel at least too close to home. And with algorithms in the fintech industry, you can, with the right amount of data, you can probably uh, plot and map out a person's life down to the last detail. You can also manipulate uh, that other person. Uh, there are instances around the flash crash where you could detect very strange patterns, high frequency uh, speed patterns around that flash crash, uh, which might have helped uh, cause it or unfortunately caused it. So when it comes to privacy and the use of data, we need to be very careful so that we don't get manipulated, so that we don't get things that hit too close to home, and we may need to ensure that we have a human interaction in everything that happens so that humans aren't left out. So my, my take on this, while I'm excited about the fintech and, and regtech uh, possibilities, I think that technology needs to be a tool, not a master. Uh, it needs to be very, very carefully thought out how it should be used and how it should not be used, uh, and that it should not be used indiscriminately. And then I think we need to simplify, for example, regtech down almost to the level of Isaac Asimov's three, uh, three robotic laws. First of all, a robot can never harm a human. A robot must always obey a human unless it uh, is prevented by the first law. And the third is the robot should prevent uh, damage to itself unless that is in conflict with the first and second laws. So we need to simplify, but we always need to have a human in there. Thank you. So please, anybody in the audience, comments, questions, whatever is, is warmly welcome. There are microphones next to your seats. Yes, please. And please state your name before. Yes, I'm Elizabeth Andrenquist. I am with NFT Ventures that you listened to before with Johan. I'm also one of the founders of Swedish FinTech Association, where we try to get all our FinTech companies to, to discuss and develop policy together with the uh, with different agencies and politicians. As, as you stated before, it's very difficult because they're small. And um, in a portfolio, we encounter numbers of problems, specifically when it comes to things like GDPR and PSD2, that actually has a lot of collisions within the legislation. Will it be possible to use AI to understand where these, where these legislations will actually um, uh, collide? Because today, Nobody really knows, and for and I understand the how you uh, when you say it from the FSA that you should treat all companies very equally. However, being a small fintech, your whole revenue is dependent on that you're betting on one type of uh, how this uh, legislation will actually be interpreted by the EU or, for instance, the Swedish agency. Whereas a, a bigger bank might have other revenues to cover that period of interpretation. So there. There's a time gap that is extremely important for these small ones, and how how should we together overcome this so, to make sure that what legislators was not thinking of will actually be devastating to a number of, of small businesses? Who wants to? Well, I can, well, I, can I can briefly start. I think that those are very relevant issues. Um, on the PSD2, I think it's important that um, everybody keeps in mind that in, in this particular case. The directive is an example of a very significant paradigm shift by means of regulation where power is uh, taken away primarily from banks and given to customers in terms of ownership of their private data. <coughs> and the customer is given the right to actually choose how the bank data, which is at the moment at the disposal of banks and maybe insurance companies, can be used uh, for other services such as providing payments. So this is an important paradigm shift which will have implications and of course it raises a number of practical issues of how all this is going to be done in practice and how all that fits into the, you know, uh, with the other regulatory framework and how that fits with the personal data protection framework which you mentioned and so on. So just to, uh, just to mention the, uh, in terms of the regulations, uh, the uh, matter has been actively uh, uh, taken on board at the level of the 
uh, European Banking Authority, uh, because this is important that we, as supervisors, do not compete with each other on, on the most liberal or the most strict or the most uh, uh, industry-friendly solution, but that we rather agree on a single solution which fits best uh, our mandate. Um, that would be my comment number one. I think you have raised a very important issue. The other comment on the speed of processing uh, applications for new uh, uh, starting new banks and new uh, new companies. Uh, this is one of those questions which we presently look at and that we will report back in, in end of November, uh, where we need to find a trade-off between ensuring that the you know less serious actors with incompetent management is not allowed to start their activities in the market at the same time that we as supervisors don't just kill new ideas because we are slow ourselves. So how to strike that balance is going to be at the at the focus. But but again, it's 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 very good that this association exists and that we have a good dialogue and this is something that we intend to do also in the future. Yeah. Anders? <clears throat> One comment, you asked if, if an AI could be used to sort of tell how to interpret these, uh, these regulations. The problem is that of course they are written by humans and humans are fallible uh, and sometimes uh, if they are incompatible, the different sets of, of regulations, um, there is no answer, there is no right way, you can't abide by them both. Uh, we've had that situation come up in a number of cases where, where one uh, set of, of rules says you have to inform the individual that you're doing this and the other one says you must absolutely not inform anyone that you're doing this. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. and, and it's, uh, for example, when it comes to personal data and the data inspection board in Sweden and cartels and the, the, um, the competition uh, authorities. And we tried to have them talk to each other and they refused. They didn't want to come to a meeting and they sit in the same room. Uh, and the solution to those things are sometimes, yes, probably you might have an AI able to tell where the conflicts are and which is a probable solution, uh, but I think in the end that's where you need the human interaction saying and, and the solution would probably be to write to the authority that you hope uh, will, will be the one regulating this and saying we are going to do this if you believe this is wrong you have to tell us, because we are interpreting rules this way and, and you have to tell us if it's wrong. I think that there is, um, I mean, in Sweden you, you can sometimes get a, a preemptive decision from the tax authorities when it comes to certain tax matters, förans uh, besked, saying, okay, this is an okay way to, to handle your taxes, we won't, uh, we won't jump, uh, jump up and down on you. And I think that sort of... of um, uh, possibility needs to exist with more authorities uh, and also looking at all this here, uh, an obligation for the authority to answer uh, yes or no. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes it feels like you're standing there shouting out into the darkness and you don't get any answers. Um, so I think AI can be a part of the solution, but not the whole solution, at least not AI how it stands today. Perhaps Philip thinks that they could Philip, do more. Please. Yeah, the, uh, the obvious thing I think that both uh, uh, the, my two colleagues have pointed out is there's conflicts between in within major legislation where there are different parts of it disagreeing. And there's even bigger conflicts between the different groups preparing legislation. And we're never going to overcome that until we get something that's machine readable that you can actually compare this. Uh, uh, at a trivial level, notice trivial, uh, one of the things that the regulators use our Alexa system for is actually to see, uh, they, they tell Alexa what, rule, what they're proposing to say and then Alexa interprets it and gives it back to them. <laughs> and then they can say, no, we didn't mean that. <laughs> uh, so at a trivial level, you know, technology is starting to do this. But with sentiment analysis and, um, you know, it, it's, it's a very good example where the academic community uh, could provide a lot of help uh, be, because it's a classic sort of AI study of, uh, you know, sentiment analysis and, uh, and text analysis. And uh, I'm sure lots of people, you know, both here and in the UK would, you know, really enjoy, you know, working on this. Uh, but until you get to the point where you can actually machine read it, uh, it won't, you'll still have these conflicts. But the worst thing is it won't actually do what the regulators want it to do and may even make things worse because people are getting confused about what actions they should be taking. Okay, uh, I don't see any hands. I have one, okay, I want to take this question. Uh, you've touched upon it a couple of times, the 
So should society have a view on the speed with which these technologies are introduced? I thought I heard Anders saying, sort of, hang on, be a bit careful, mistakes can be made if we go too quickly. And I thought maybe I heard Philip being more, uh, there are lots of money to be saved. Yeah. And if there are lots of money to be saved, we should sort of do it quickly in order to Again. save it sooner rather than later, sort of. Yeah. And, and sort of also in regulation. Well, again, how, how quickly the ancient, uh, ancient references. I'm I'm currently listening to Silent Spring. Uh, it's a book from the 60s, uh, written in the 50s and 60s about pesticides in the U.S. and and uh, which had a revolutionary impact on on environmental uh, the environmental movement. And uh, after that book, and, and after that, uh, and we still have that in, in Swedish law today, there's the cautionary principle. Before you introduce something to the, into the wild, uh, you should have a, a sort of be Caution, uh, have caution and, and think about what this may do before you introduce it. So I know that this is, the train has left the station, but I'm going to scream after the train when it <laughs> leaves, saying, think a couple of times before putting new uh, models and new algorithms and, and new systems uh, onto the market, because it might not, as Philip has, has said a couple of times, might not, may not do what you intended it to do. Yeah. So I think there's need to be a, a sort of precautionary principle, yes. Philip, did you, did you want to? Yeah, just one very short empirical example coming with, from my own background where I have spent, you know, uh, both leading a stock exchange but also then working for the regulatory authority in the Baltics if we are kind of a critical. Um, um, then we can see that, you know, the time when the Baltic states became, you know, members of the European <laughs> Union, uh, their uh, whole... Uh, real estate market was basically uncollateralized. You know, their L LTV was, you know, uh, more or less equal to zero. Now that LTV uh, switched to a figure which was in 50s uh, in terms of percent. You know, in, in a number of years, that process went too quickly both for consumers on, and for the banks. Some of the banks even discovered that the pricing model is a direct copy of Finland, which basically, you know, prices all the products at LIBOR plus a fixed percent, irrespective of banks' own funding costs. Which, in 2008, at least for two banks, uh, sky rocketed uh, significantly. So uh, just to uh, a little bit agree on, on, on what was proposed that in, in, in I mean, you, you cannot, I mean, if you don't understand the risks, you cannot just say that firms always are right. I mean, that is my own uh, answer to the question. You need to understand the risks. If you don't understand the risks, then there is a good chance that you are the person sitting with, you know, the, uh, the blackjack and, and you might not want to be in that situation. Philip? Uh, I've got three um, probably contradictory things to say. Uh, the first is to say that most good AI systems have a built-in human uh, element. So people have backed off largely from automated trading systems and uh, uh, using humans uh, a, a, lot, a lot more. Um, uh, secondly, uh, my, my wife loves the ser series Aircraft Investigators. I guess you can you get it as well. If you look at this for a short period, almost every accident is caused by the pilots trying to override the technology. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it, it, isn't a, I, I, it isn't a case that I, I'm sort of a technology uh, philistine or whatever the right word is. The, the other thing I'd point out, the third thing, un, unrelated, uh, and this is the innovation uh, thing, as you said about the genie out of the bottle. The American companies, Google, Facebook, and the other ones, I believe I'm collect, uh, correct in saying, basically grew on the back of the Americans not having any privacy laws or data privacy laws. So we, we can do all the right things, but we can end up driving industry uh, ab abroad, which, or, you know, or, or, you know, you find out that Alibaba is, you know, or Alipay is running your banking in, in, in Europe because of this. So there is, uh, there is a, um, I think, an onus on all of us, uh, including the regulator, to actually manage the health of the industry uh, to make sure that it prospers in Europe. And it isn't just, uh, you know, well, well, we did everything right, but now it's just left for Singapore. Okay. Thank you. Lots of movie references today. That's nice. Please. <laughs> Okay. One, of, one of the things that's worked really well is the uh, the FCA's introduced this project Innovate, and um, which I've had a bit to do with, and um, and sandboxes and reg tech and thing and things like this, and they've been very successful in nurturing um, 
fintech companies uh, by putting them through this project Innovate Sandbox. And you might think, if they go through this, they'll have less regulation. But the because the FCA can see them and has lots of interaction with them, they're probably more highly regulated uh, than the companies outside of the sandbox. The big thing is that the FCA is basically saying to these fintech sectors, um, we're going to need to regulate you, you know that, what do you believe we should do? And we'll tell you whether we, that we find that acceptable. And, and this sort of interaction, close interaction, has worked very well with, with, with the FCA in, in London. Yeah. Anders? A comment. I think that uh, the reality is that uh, you can actually program um, a system with morals. Uh, it's actually possible. Uh, and we'll have to do that quite soon. Um, we had a discussion, I had a discussion, uh, a panel this, in Almadalen this year about self-driving cars. And in the not too distant future, you know, the old moral uh, question, a train is hurling down a train track and there is uh, 10 people standing on the track. You're standing beside a point. You can turn a lever and the train will go down another direction. There is one individual on that track who will die. Uh, and so do you turn that lever? Then you will have actively killed one person, but you will have saved 10. And that's something we're actually going to have to program cars with in the future. But in the case of the car, it might actually be, should we hit those 10 people or should the car go off the cliff to kill the driver? And which company wants to sell a, a product which says, we may kill you. Uh, <laughs> but you can actually, pro in certain instances, you can program morals into a regulatory system as well. And I think the, the cautionary principle that I, I mentioned before, that does not only apply to the industry, it applies to the regulator as well. Uh, I think that we need to have systems which advise individuals, but in humans, but then the humans should be the ones taking the decisions. So you can absolutely use uh, RegTech to, to provide that advice for the Alexa system to say, this is what the outcome of this regulation would be. And then the human will have to think, is that the outcome, outcome I wanted? Uh, but I still think that the decision should rest with the, regu the human in most cases. It might not be possible in high frequency trading and so forth and so, so on, but, but sometimes it can. Well, this, we are running out of time. Uh, I thought maybe if I could ask you a last question and give you two minutes each to answer it, consisting of two parts. The first is, what is the current state of, of, of affairs in, concerning reg tech in Europe? Sort of how far has it, where are we? And second question, sort of in a five, say, five-year perspective, where, how fast do you expect this to develop? Where are we heading? And you can, if you can each sort of have a quick go on that one. Right. Well, first, thank you for giving two minutes. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, let's just very quickly summarize. I think the, the present state of affairs can be <coughs> characterized by enormous amount of analytical reports on, on, on fintech and risks with fintech and supervisory approaches to fintech. EBA has just released one during the summer. Financial Stability Board has released one during the summer. And the Basel Committee is going to release, I think, or has already released one. Uh, on, on the same question. Uh, so there is a lot of thinking going on in the heads of regulators. Um, and I think it all centers on the risks and the roles of the regulators that in order to address those risks. Um, on, on one point where I want to disagree with the previous question, which is relevant for the answer to your question, Per, I think it's not true that fintech was not regulated uh, before. Actually, the truth is that it was regulated in exactly the same manner as any other provision of services irrespective of technology. So, in theory, the regulation was technologically neutral. The problem was that regulators did not have enough interaction with the industry, and industry did not have enough interaction with regulators. So, very often, the practical outcomes was that those services were lightly regulated or not regulated, or firms were simply not aware that they have to be regulated, or what licenses were needed. And I think that is a very important gap, uh, not least for Sweden, but it is addressed uh, in, in a very good uh, cooperative manner, uh, and also that, that it's addressed in a way where we don't create any regulatory uh, you know, rek uh, makka, any regulatory, uh, you know, a free lunch for 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 nobody. That that we uh, we have consistent approach. That that uh, that there is a level of regulatory playing field, and that we are mindful of our main role to protect financial stability and interests of consumers. Thank you. Thank you. You did well on two minutes. Some <laughs> okay. Anders. 
I think that where we are today, I think we're still in the infancy of, of fintech, both development and regulation. I think there will be a lot of trial and error in the coming five years. And uh, I think, unfortunately, some of the regulations that we have today will be preventing innovation. I think some of the European legislation that we have today will be driving business abroad or outside the EU, perhaps to the UK, which will no longer be in the EU. Um, and and uh, I, I am sort of uh, afraid that in five years' time, um, the regulators will be trying to regulate uh, today's reality, whereas reality has moved on. Um, but uh, again, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm proved wrong. Thank you. Philip, you got the last word. Okay, the, um, there's a huge amount of experimentation going on in London, and, and this includes the big banks, the fintech and regtech companies, but also the regulator. And this is also, I think this is very healthy because everybody then, by doing this experimentation, understands what works and doesn't work in AI and, 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 and blockchain. So I think I'd encourage everybody to, to, to experiment as much as possible. Long term, uh, I think I'm probably more worried about uh, the, the Chinese companies, you know, Alipay and, and Tencent, maybe Facebook. Um, I, I expect a lot of the fintech companies to be bought up by the big banks, but... Um, you know the, the the truck they should be or the train they should be avoiding probably are these uh, you know um, big Chinese companies that uh, could come out of nowhere and uh, you know gobble everything up. Thank you very much, all three. We thank you, audience, for your questions.